Okay, so good to see you again. And I just want to say happy Father's Day to all of you. Um, like I said, I just realized it yesterday. I, I'm really not good at remembering birthdays, holidays, and uh, days of celebration. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what I'm thinking, but that's just the way I am. So I'm glad that I remembered, and I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that my family remembered. And um, yeah, so as we begin our, today's worship, uh, let us think about our Father and what He has, like our God the Father, not our earthly Father, but let us also, uh, and let us think about God who has done and has given to us above and beyond um, what we expected and what we have imagined. Because of the coronavirus, uh, we tend to stay home a lot, uh, we as in our family. And uh, we don't really go out unless we have to do some grocery shopping or we have to go buy something at, I don't know, Canadian Tire or something. But we have a, a new family thing now where we go for um, a stroll in the evening. And what's nice about it is when we come back, we open the garage door and we go to the freezer and we get ourselves an ice cream or popsicle, whatever we, got, we, we have in the, in the garage. So if you ever want some ice cream and you're in the neighborhood, just open our garage and you, you can get some for yourself too. So sometimes we sit down and uh, we eat ice cream outside on, in our, on our porch. And uh, one of my kids told me a story and um, she said this story not out of spite or out of bitterness, but she just thought it was funny. And uh, one of the things that I have uh, in our house is uh, when you come downstairs in the morning, you have to say hello. You have to greet one another. And uh, I'm really big on that. And if you don't do that, uh, you, you get scolded and, and you'll know about my displeasure. So kids come down and, you know, it took some years or whatever, but kids now they come and we greet each other. It's a good practice, right? Uh, but sometimes when they come down, uh, when she comes down, I, I'm, I'm working on, my, on, on the table and I'm writing my sermon. <laughs> she will come down and say, good morning. And I'll be like, oh, no, I lost my train of thought. Uh, and, and then, you know, I'll be like upset about that, right? So then what she began to do was that she would stomp downstairs, like stomp, 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 so that I would hear her come down the stairs. And that would be a cue right audible cue for me to sort of wind down and, and, and know that there's someone coming down the stairs but that would never work because i don't hear it because I, I i i'm a master daydreamer and I, when i'm focused i can't hear those things and you know what um in my so so i would express my displeasure if they don't say hi i would express my displeasure if they do say hi and and, and, and in my defense guys <laughs> um when I'm on a creative mode, like I'm writing the sermon and my train of thought is moving along. And if that train gets stopped, I don't pick up from there, from that station. I have to go back to the terminal. I have to go back to the beginning. And then I, that train of thought, which began, might not get to the place where it was originally headed. So to lose a thought, to lose train of thought is incredibly disruptive for me. But I, as I listened to the story and, and we giggled about it and I apologize or whatever. But I realized that um, I need covering in my life. And I thought about how um, confusing it would have been for my kids. Like, say hi, don't say hi, <laughs> say hi, don't say hi. And they have to read between the lines and they don't know which one, which behavior is the right behavior at the time. And you know, um, my mom has covered me in my life, and I'm sure my dad has also covered me. Where I shared with you before, it was we had Christmas dinner, and, and middle of the dinner, my mom, I guess she felt sense of her mortality, and her she felt she was old, and you know it wouldn't be strange to see her go at any time of the day, or any 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 moment now. And she said, John, I when I die. And, you know, I don't know if your parents always talk about death, but, you know, my mom does. They say, when I die, I don't want you to feel sad because you made me happy. You are a good son. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not true. I remember the times that I brought so much heartache to my mom 
And here she is sitting across the table and I just came from Toronto to eat. And she's like, you know, you, you were a good son. You made me happy. And I don't want you to feel bad because I'm okay. I'm okay. And I feel really covered by that because I know I'm ultimately not a good son. But here she is giving um, grace and forgiveness. And I wanted to be that kind of parent. But here I am this week sitting on our porch, listening to my kids. And I realized, oh boy, I've been covered by my kids more than me covering for them. The truth is, if you're living and breathing, if you're alive, you need to be covered. You need to be forgiven and you need to be, you have to be graced and give, uh, somebody has to cut you some slack and they have to accept you as who you are despite the fact that you are broken and you're sinful and you make a lot of mistakes. And you know, like if you think about it, what kind of rule is this? You have to come down and say hello and you have to come down and say, don't say hello. It's really a hypocrisy and an inconsistency, and I don't know how my kids have survived in that kind of environment. But as Jack has read and shared with us today, uh, we'll be talking about the Day of Atonement, which is the most sacred day of Jewish holidays. And holidays, not like our holidays, where we fire to fireworks and we go out to cottages, is for them is is holy days. And 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 Day of Atonement, what they do is for ten days they repent. They just fine tooth, they go through their life with fine tooth comb and, and just repent all the things that they need to be covered. Matter of fact, the, the, the word atonement is, uh, that comes from the word covering. In the same way when Adam and Eve sinned and they realized that they were, that they're, they're naked and, and they felt ashamed, God covers them. And the day of atonement is really the proper translation or the, the, root translation could be that uh, is that uh, it's day of covering where God comes to you and he covers you for the sins and mistakes and inconsistencies and contrast all these gunk and grime that have come upon the soul and life and hands of your life so on this day Israelites would be all outside of the tents of tabernacle or the tabernacle and Aaron, the high priest. So number one priest would come and sacrifice a bull for himself because he can't approach God because all the sins that he has in his life, because it's inevitable that you have sins. Even though you're doing a good thing, like teaching your kids to say hello and and be a, 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 have proper etiquette. Although you're doing good things like writing a sermon and, and being diligent about it, even though you're doing good things, within those things come, comes a moment where you need covering, you need atonement, and you need forgiveness, and you need to be reconciled. So Aaron comes and he sacrifices a bull so that he can come to God and say, forgive my people. Forgive, them for my, forgive, forgive me for my sins. And please forgive them for the sins that they have confessed. For God is holy. And no sin or no hint of darkness or unholiness can ever enter into his presence. To make atonement, to cover for his people, he would have to sacrifice two animals. One he would kill, he would sacrifice, and he would offer it at the altar. Second, uh, uh, and he would, yeah, anyway, he would would kill one goat. And the second goat, what he would do is he would lay his hand on the head of the goat and confess all the sins upon it. And he would take, he would get someone to take that goat and take it into a place of desolation, into the wilderness where life for the goat is surely anything but guaranteed. And the goat would be released into the wilderness where it, where it wanders and it dies. That's where we get the word scapegoat. And, and, and this is how people can once again come to God and have their sins forgiven and approach God again and be in his presence. So what kind of sins would they have confessed? Well, I think to, turn, to get to that answer, we have to look into 
some of the sins and mistakes and inconsistencies that we find in the scripture. Remember, the, remember Cain and Abel, where Cain offered, Cain and Abel brothers, two brothers, they gave offering to God. And one was Cain offered as a token gesture. It wasn't a sincere worship. He was just going through the motion and he just wanted to show God the mechanics of worship so that he would be blessed. And I look to myself and I look to our church and we should ask, are we just going through the motion today? Or is Christ alone that he has ended the striving of me being good enough? Or did he, do I actually believe that he has paid for my sins and he was merciful to me? There are other instances where lack of trust on part of Abraham and Isaac and all the other people that are written in the scripture have led to all sorts of sins where they treated one another like slaves and they, their interaction, their fellowship was nothing but mechanical and transactional. If you do this for me, I will give this to you. There were betrayals, there were murmurs, there were gossiping, and there were murderous intent and, and uh, fraternicide. And, and, and there's 10 commandments where thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not murder. And when we look into all of these things, when Israelites looked into all of these things in their history and in their law, they were able to bring a, a sincere repentance before the Lord. And as they confessed all of them, they knew that there wasn't one single sin that God would say, mm-mm, or you have 10 too many sins. Or you're, you did not honor God, or you did not honor your parents. But they knew that all of their sins can be placed upon these animals. And as they were sacrificed and abandoned in the desert, that their sins will be forgiven. What about for us today? I think growing up, I struggled with repenting. So I naturally leaned on the things that I like more in the way that I related to God. I don't know if you'll believe me, but I was in the praise team for a long, long time. And I served, uh, quote unquote, faithfully in the church. I organized events and whatever gifts I had, I, I, I used it to the best of my ability, whether, regardless of how it panned out. But repentance was something that was difficult for me. But we need to look to the scripture just like Israelites have looked to the scripture and see if there's anything that is preventing us from coming to the Lord. If there's any sin in our life that keeps us distant and puts space between us and God. Have we stolen from anyone, whether it be their honor or a reputation? Have we been greedy and kept more things for ourselves and we actually need to we covet anyone else or anything else that does not belong to us. Have we committed murder because we have gossiped and we did a character assassination of someone? Have we complained and murmured and being ungrateful for the things that we have, although it may, in your opinion, it might be little and others have more, which leads you to more coveting. When I think about repentance, I think of these things, but furthermore, um, I, I do take time to think about Manhattan Project. And I don't know if all of you are, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, but Manhattan Project was a project, a high, highly, uh, high classified, top secret project uh, during World War II, where the US government was making a nuclear bomb to be used against its enemies, namely against Japan. And because of the nature of the project, they could not reveal uh, what was actually being made. So they contracted all sorts of scientists and engineers all over the states. And they gave, the government of the United Military uh, gave them a very specific compartmentalized project. So they had no idea what they were making. Some people thought they were making a switch. Some people thought they were just making a motherboard 
Some people thought they were just making some sort of a wire, efficient wiring system, and they never met with each other. They never even knew that other people existed. And they had no idea what their circuitry or, 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 uh, or switch or the material or design or the parachute, that the larger parachute that they were making, they had no idea what this all were coming together to create. But at the end, all those things came together to make a nuclear bomb. Now, I think some of the people who worked on the project felt that ultimately their project ended the war uh, early and they saved many lives, and that is true. And I cannot imagine the world where Nazis and uh, their allies have won. And I don't know what the world would look like today if that had happened. But people also walked away feeling devastated. What have I done? I didn't know. I was just making a circuitry or I was just making a switch. And sometimes I feel like that about my life. Uh, what bad things have I done? I, I, I barbecue. I, I play games, I, I do sermons, I go to church, and I buy a car, and I go to grocery stores, and I drink coffee. And I'm not sure where this coffee bean came from, but I'm drinking it, and, and I have cell phone with, with lithium ion battery in it, and I am part of this life, and I don't know what my actions will eventually end up doing, and what consequences it will have on the people who get these raw materials or what consequences it will have in the environment that I live in. And I don't really think about these things, and when I, but when I do, I feel overwhelmed. That it seems like, just like the movie um, Matrix, maybe I am a virus, and the host is the planet, and we're just wreaking havoc. This is when I realize that I need covering for my actions for the perceptions that I have about myself and the world that I live in. I need to think and, and to review some of the things that I, I do in my life relationally, the way that I buy things, the way that I consume things, the habits that I have. And although it used to paralyze me in some ways, but now when I know, knowing Christ, and how God saves and how God transforms the repentant sinners gives me hope in this world. Some of you may still feel, well, that can't be helped and I, I, I don't think I'm doing anything bad at all just by living and I agree with you, it's, it's true. But what you and I have to come to terms and grip is that after World War II, when um, Israel, Mossad, their, their um, Arm, their you know secret service type of like uh, special forces they tracked down and they monitored all the Nazi high high-ranking Nazi officials and they they traced them they they uh, tracked them down and they found one particular gentleman in Argentina and Ayman was his name and he was responsible for millions of Jewish people sent to the concentration camp. And he single-handedly, and he was the key, he was the axis of Holocaust other than Hitler. And he was put on trial. He was uh, abducted from Argentina. He was brought back and he was put on trial. And, and during the trial, he said, I didn't know that these people were getting butchered and killed in a gas chamber. I only follow the orders that came down from the top. And I think there was, he wrote a book, A Good Nazi or something like that. And um, these titles are kind of escaping me now. But watching the trial was a lady, a philosopher by the name of Hannah Arendt. And what she observed was that evil is not really anywhere. It's not a particular or specific person. As she listened to Ayman talk, she realized he was just a normal, average guy. And she got into a lot of trouble for saying that from Jewish people because they said, no, he's evil and, and, and he's part of the Nazi regime. And she got in a lot of flack from the German and saying that, no, um, we, you know, evil is not everywhere. It can, it, evil doesn't come from anywhere. It, it just 
specific people in our society like Hitler who have sinned and committed these atrocities. But she said, no, e evil, it, it can, anyone can be this evil. And that was her conclusion. Of course, after uh, stating that, there were many researches done that actually is an accepted fact that anyone can commit crimes such as Holocaust. They just need the right environment and the right motive. What we realized after World War II is that anyone can be this evil. And that they have research to back this up. Of course, we knew this from the scripture. It's not good people sometimes doing bad things. It's not good people sometimes doing really, really horrible things. And good people just need to do good things and improve themselves to become a better, better people and to be accepted by God. Scriptural view is not that. What we call total depravity is not good people doing bad things and they need to be redeemed because ultimately they're good. No, it's sinners doing bad things. That we're all capable of sin and we don't even know that we're committing a sin because that's how deprived we are. Here in the Day of Atonement, what we see is not good people coming to God and saying, we made a mistake. What God is saying is, you are sinner, period, and you cannot come into my presence unless there is something takes place of your sins through death. They did animal sacrifice so that the price of sin will be laid upon that animal and people would once again come and enjoy fellowship with God. My question to you is, what will you sacrifice today so that you may be atoned of your sins, that your sins will be covered and you will have fellowship with God and you can come to him? It's no other than Jesus Christ who put his life, who gave his life and who was abandoned by God into the wilderness so that he will carry away and put away all of our sins. What the day of covering, the day of atonement teaches us is not that we are just simply sinful and, and there, there needs to be some sort of atonement. That's half of the story. But the place where atonement, the covering takes place, the tabernacle itself is in the center of Israel. All the tribes camped right around the place of worship, the tabernacle. And God was right in the middle providing salvation, forgiveness, and atonement, and covering for his people. What does this tell you about God? That he forgave us, that he wants to be in our midst. It's not God is somewhere distant and saying, you can only come to me if you're forgiven, and this is how you get forgiven. No, he is already in the camp of sin. And he, is, he has sent his son to be sacrificed and to take away and put away our sins. So God is, God has, God has abandoned his own right to safety and life and to happiness, to put it in human terms, so that we will be forgiven, that so that he can remain in the tent with us. We are forgiven out of grace. There is not one sin. There is not too many, there's no, too, there's no such thing as too many sins. But you are accepted purely by the grace of God. Now, J.I. Packer commenting on this, uh, the issue of being forgiven all the time and to be graced and mercy by God in all places, all time. And people have argued with him, doesn't that mean that Christians can do anything they want and live their, live their life any way they want and yet still be forgiven and accepted by God? So how, how does that do anything for our transformation? What the reformers saying is not because you're forgiven no matter what, you can live your life any way you want. No. Packer said this well and he said, ethics is our gratitude. Ethics is our gratitude to the grace that we have received. We're not trying to be good people, ethical people, sacrificial people, a people who serve and humble ourselves and even sacrificing ourselves for other people so that we will be accepted by God. No, because he has already accepted us through Jesus Christ. 
he has put away and carried our sins through his son who sacrificed at the altar and he was, who was uh, released and abandoned into the wilderness. He is, what we are called to do is to respond in ethics as a form of gratitude. Today, if that is your faith, that you respond to, your response, your, your gratitude to God is your ethics. That your ethics is not so that you will become a better person, good person, lovable person, and who is accepted by God. But that is your gratitude. That is your sacrifice. And that is your worship to God. God, I have sins. I have sins that I don't even know that I'm committing. I'm part of this larger wheel of sin. And I, I can't get myself out. But through your grace, I have been accepted. So my gratitude to you is my ethics. I shall love my neighbor as myself. I shall not steal. I shall not covet. I shall not murder. I will not complain. I will not murmur. And I will only worship one God. That is the form of gratitude that we show to God. We all need covering because we're all part of this larger project where we always will sin. There's no such thing as Christians who need to just try harder and to be more morally upright so that we'll be accepted by God. No, we need to repent because our sins are too great. And God has paid for our sins. He has put away his own rights because God so loved the world. So I encourage you today to deeply, deeply repent. Take a moment, take an hour, take a day, or, or skip a meal and, and just really deeply repent and see what spiritual, ethical response you will make to God as a, as a great gratitude and thanks. And that should be your worship. And that should be your discipleship.